let's just get going. Get, give me a bit of a snapshot because, like I said before, you're very prolific. You do a lot of things, but you started off in journalism. So just give me a bit of a backstory, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, it was always my ambition, right from sort of being 11 or 12, to be a journalist. Um, and that's what I did become. And, and um, you know, I had quite a bit of success. I wrote the national papers. I did a lot of sports writing and football reporting which was um, my own passion. Um, and I did that for years and years, always as a freelancer. I've never worked um, with a, any sort of long-term contract in my entire career. Um, but there's been a lot of changes um, during that time. I started freelancing properly in about 1995. Um, and the career, the industry's changed massively, um, journalism and how it works. The same for photography as well, actually. Um, but after about 15 years, I always had a slight interest in photography. Um, I'd done a couple of courses, a City and Guilds course at Preston College, um, and then I did an MA um, at Bolton University. And that, um, I was still doing the journalism at the time, but that MA course and the way you thought about social issues and storytelling mm. changed the whole way, really my outlook on life. Well, can I just pick up on that? Sorry, yeah. just quickly jump in there. I, mean, I think that's interesting because, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm from that sort of uh, publishing background. I started off as a paste of artist in the newspaper game, so I worked with guys. I did that at the LEP. Yeah, well, there you go. I was at the LEP for a few years, many, many years ago, a lot before you, before you were there. But I think uh, I can see how the industry's changed, and I, I think that's an interesting grounding to what you're doing, but you are very much a... The Martin Parr of Preston, I'd like to think you are. You know, you sort of you're very observant of things going off. What? So, I mean, it's it's interesting because we had a quick conversation because I've never. You're the first art, uh, uh, photography artist that I've interviewed, and it's obviously it's a discipline. It's a discipline in its own right, and it's got very lots of uh, strings to its bow because you cross this divide between journalism, journalist, and observation and art. So what, what was the turning point then? The, the turning point what was the MA in photography. Um, and we had to do a project, a couple of projects, which one was a travel project, which I loved, and one was social issues. Um, and this was in 2007. Um, and I had this great idea for a travel project. We did, we did a travel project. I went to um, Venice for a few days and photographed it and done this great project. And that could have gone on and been my major MA project. But at the same time, we had to do a small social issues project. And I had the idea, um, it was just before the smoking ban came in. Um, and I had, had this idea of documenting the smokers in the pubs and the bingo halls and all around before the ban. And I felt that was too good of an opportunity to miss. Mm -hmm. I, I understood then if I took those pictures, they'd become historical documents very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a good project and it was my major MA project and it just changed the whole way I thought about the world and the stories I wanted to tell and I went from wanting to tell um, to sports report and I used to tell a lot of like you know the funny stories you have on page three the sun and the mirror and the star yeah. these quirky sort of daft things I used to tell loads of them for national papers um, and it was just fluff stuff and I just went from that to wanting to tell serious stories so um and then me writing, then followed the photography where I, I started writing about serious issues as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the photography started dictating um, what I was doing and what I was writing about. So my whole, my whole way of looking at the world and social issues just changed through, through documentary photography, really. Um, and yeah, my background is in journalism. So I think I have quite an unusual um connection with art and, and it is very sort of factually based i've not got any arts any art training you know i've not done art at any sort of degree level um, and i think about art in relation to entertaining people rather than art it's still about telling stories and sometimes the projects that do have different levels which yeah. good art does but it's always really strongly based on the on the idea that it should entertain people, and I never ever lose sight of that, which I, which I think some artists do, and and that can make the art inaccessible to the wider population. And, and I I always think produce the art 
that entertains people and brings them into art in general. And I, and I think in general, photography is a really accessible art form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, and, and I see it as bridging the gap between people who don't engage with art and top end art. And, and that's why I really love photography. And I, I, I can see that. And that's an interesting, I think, going back to your journalistic, your journalism world where you sort of started from and doing those sort of more things with humour. It's interesting how you said you went from that sort of going into more serious issues, but then I still feel like you inject a lot of humour into your work. You know, you don't, it's like you don't take yourself, well, you are serious, you are very serious in what you do, but you don't take yourself too seriously, I don't think. I, even though I've only just met you and just looking at observing your work, there's definitely, you've kept that humour, yeah. which I think is really nice, which makes it accessible, I think, um, which I think is really interesting. I don't know whether that's a, you do that on purpose, or whether it's just an actually you are how you are as an individual. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess it's a bit of both, but it, it, it's definitely right. What I consider to be my best piece of work, which is a, a book and images, but it's essentially a written book. Um, and it's about the, hist about the history of the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Mm. Um, it is a very funny book. Um, it's the only um, humorous book that's been written about the conflict between Israel and Palestine, which is obviously a very serious issue. Um, but um, the humor, I think, makes it accessible um, to people who don't understand or don't know enough about yeah. that situation in the Middle East. Let's just um, look up on that for a second. I mean, that's a quite, uh, like I said, it's a very heavy, a very heavy subject. And um, what got, what, what took you to that then? I mean, because I know you're into your traveling and you like your travel. Um, was it just a, a traveling experience or was there some sort of political motive behind it or inspiration behind it? Uh, well, I, I, after I'd done my MA and I'd done my smoking project, I, I, done, I did a, a project called Outsiders, which was a series of interviews with unusual, unique and misunderstood people. And it was a really wide um, uh, range of people interviewed. And I did travel quite a way around the world um, to interview people. And two of the people I interviewed was a teen, two teenagers, um, one Palestinian and one Israeli who had both lost family members during the conflict. Mm. And the idea was I photographed them and interviewed them and their statements um, of their life experience were very similar, but they're at opposite ends of this, of this conflict. Mm. Um, so I did that and then a couple of years later, I got offered, offered the opportunity to go back to the West Bank um, and attend a festival, a youth festival, um, which I took up. Um, it wasn't quite the trip I was expecting. Um, I was with about 200 activists who had flown in from around the world to, to protest in various cities in the West Bank. Mm. Um, and it all, the whole trip unraveled. It was very badly organized and there was a lot of friction. Um, and I, I documented what was happening, what was happening, um, and wrote about it, and, and, the, and the book came out of that. Um, and it was, um, you know, the photographs that I love that I took, um, and, and the story itself, you know, I think it, it's really interesting. There's loads of history um, about the conflict and why it's like that, but also um, wrapped up in this week that I had and, and the calamitous, calamitous things that were happening. Um, wow. It's, it's, yeah, it's funny. I think it's kind of funny. Quite a, a scary time, maybe, in your life. You know, and it's, it's interesting how you sort of come out with that with humour. I think I would have just tried to go out on the next plane out of there, but I, thought, I find the fact that you've embraced it and put a spin on it is quite interesting. Well, when I was there, because of the demonstrations, um, and then there was some rockets fired from Gaza, really? uh, and, and they reached Tel Aviv, and the first it was the first rockets to, to reach Tel Aviv, and in decades and Tel Aviv airport, airport was actually closed the day before, well, a, a few hours, I think it was closed the day before and then, and then a few hours after we took off. Um, but there was also, um, we got, we, we turned up after, at, at the hotel after being out in Jerusalem for the day um, and went for our meal. Um, and we were told we couldn't have a meal in the hotel that night as we, as we usually did. We were being invited to have a meal in the, Gaz in, in the West Bank military general's compound. Um, and this was about three hours after the Gazan military general's compound had been bombed and he'd been killed. Um, so- Are you looking forward to that then? 
<laughs> well, well, there's a group of six or seven of us sat, stood in the foyer and said, um, what are we going to do? And three or four of them went to a, a cafe down the road and the rest of us, four of us, did actually go to the compound and it was very scary. Nothing half bad, bad happened, but there were points in it where we thought we we're going to get, um, you know, there was like these Russian mafia types people, you know, when we arrived in, in this compound, these massive, you know, steel gates open and closing. Wow. We were taken into this building. It was a really dusty building up these stairs with these big, big guys at the front of us and behind us. And we just didn't know what was going to happen. And in the end, it was, it was like just, just a big feast. That, I mean, that must have been a turning point, surely, in your, in your life. I mean, that, I mean, that to me sounds, um, a terrifying, but also a bit of one of those moments where I think sometimes you've got to open up your, I think as an artist and especially with the type of work that you do, you've got to open yourself up to the universe a little bit and sort of see what happens, which is in itself a very brave move. But, um, you know, what, um, what, it, was it a turning, was that another turning point, would you say, in the way you, your outlook on life or not? Or did you brush it off as another experience? Um, I mean, I, I was I was aware, I was well aware by then, because I haven't been to the West Bank previously in, in, um, in Israel, um, what was going on. So, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's just little things. But, you know, when, when I grew up, um, I remember seeing images of Yasser Arafat on, on the BBC News with this sort of being mob of Palestinians shouting shout his name. And, and it was it was kind of um, the news footage on the BBC or ITV would tend to portray him and the Palestinians as these uh, kind of animals and, and had a similar opinion of the people of Syria, where Syria was just this awful, um, you know, hardcore state where you wouldn't want to go. But then you actually go to these places and meet the people and they're just normal people and the Palestinians living in houses, some of them which are more palatial than than what we live in in the UK and, and the really gentle, caring people. And, and what, what we're seeing in our news is, is totally different to what the perception is. And my perception had already changed of um, the West Bank and Palestinians and then of Syrians where they are just not, a lot of them are just normal people and, and, and not these fanatics that sort of were kind of led to believe by the media. Um, and I, I think that, that that's quite an eye opening experience. You, you, do, you don't think you're the victim of misrepresentation um, from your own media in this country, but we are. Um, and until these sort of things are pointed out, people people don't realise that. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's a definitely a hot topic at the minute because I think, especially with what's happening with COVID, I think people are getting a little bit uh, concerned about the media what being what we're being fed. I think this is the problem with the modern modern world at the minute now with the information that we've been fed it's very difficult to know what's true and what's not and uh, well it's not so much a lie it's more to do with the distortion of the truth <laughs> if that makes sense it's yeah. a, it's a perspective and i think is that something that um would you say now is sort of uh, indicative of your work then do you try and put um you know because i know you've been involved in sort of you know street level roots level community work is that trying to put a, a, a i.e the homelessness work that you've been involved with is that is that there again putting a um a more truthful angle on things would you say is, is that part of your remit with your work yeah i mean it's all all the photography essays and projects that i do it's all about storytelling it's telling a story of something or some someone but within that I'm always putting forward a different point of view and what I think is maybe is a more accurate point of view, but it's put forward with the intention of making the viewer think about what they're looking at and possibly changing the point of view they had on the specific subjects mm -hmm. or social issue. Um, and I, I, you know, that's like quite a driving factor for me. And I think it's quite an important um, uh, part of art. I think in a lot of great art always has this, this underlying um, meaning that they're trying to push forward and get you to think about things differently. Um, I do it in a way where I'm trying to be honest in what I present and it's, it's just like have a look at this and 
maybe change your point of view. There's, no, there's nothing misleading and, and obviously trying to do it in a positive way um, to, to think about things or issues more positively. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I do with all the projects. It's a common theme. I just want to go back, A, well, A, how come you landed in Preston and B, where's this passion for the city come from? Okay, well, I mean, I landed here because I came to university and uh, mm -hmm. I never left, um, basically. I've, I've had a, a few years living outside the city um, in the Rebel Valley, um, but I've lived the majority of the past uh, 20 odd years in Preston. Um, carried on at university, I started um, freelance writing and that just carried on. So I was doing that when I was a student and just carried it on um, as soon as I finished university. Um, so that's why uh, I live in the city. Um, all my work up until maybe six years ago was really, um, it wasn't to do with the city. It, it, I was working for London newspapers or magazines based in Peterborough or Bath. Um, and it's only with the art, when I started doing the more artistic stuff that I started engaging a bit more within the city and, get, and started getting to know the artists and people on the council and all the, all the art events that, 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 that were going on, are going on in the city. Um, so it, it was quite, it was a really pleasant experience after getting to know um, the artists, you know, particularly um, when Hammer Jam, the coffee shop was open, I used to go in there and, and met a lot of people in there. And, and there's quite a good community thing going on about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's changed my relation to the city. And I just all of a sudden got to know so many more people who were interested in the arts or, or creatives themselves. And, and I joined this community and I loved it. And, and that sort of inspired me to start doing the more arty stuff that I do. Because the, the, I also put on shows and, and I started doing that. And it, um, I really started, I felt like I embedded myself in the city and, and really, uh, really, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And uh, apart from just putting the COVID to one side for a minute, I mean, is that, did you see that? Because I think there's, there's always this debate about, I mean, I don't want to go on about uh, Preston too long. It's just interesting to see what your perspective is. But I think that there's always this yeah. sort of complain, complaint about it not being culturally rich enough with the arts and the creativity compared to Manchester and Liverpool. Obviously, it's a smaller city. But for me, it's felt like it's there's a lot of cool things going on. Maybe there's not wired up together enough and maybe not promoted well enough on, on some cases. But, you know, what's your, you know, you've got the feet on the ground. What's your perspective on that? I mean, I, th I think you're right. I do also work a lot in Blackpool and Manchester and across the north and Newcastle and Yorkshire. Um, and I see what goes on in other cities. And I do think um, this city has a problem with the arts and in, in its output and in, in the way it reaches the communities mm. and the people, um, whether that's through engagement or just basic letting people know about the events that are happening. Um, I can see where the gaps are in, in the setup and particularly in encouraging other creatives to do things. Yes, it's smaller than Manchester, but um, it still can do better and, and I, I hope you know, it will do better and, and things can change and things are changing. Things have changed slowly. The Harris has started putting on so many more events, yeah, yeah. Um, which has been really good. And the, and the Lancashire Encounter Festivals. Um, the, the, uh, interestingly, the only, the only part of the arts, which I think it punches above its weight, is in contemporary performance, um, which are the kind of shows that I put on um, as producer and also Derelict puts on um, at the university. And I think, we combined have um, created a, a little microculture of contemporary performance in Preston that's bigger than the city can can really um, support. But the people keep coming, um, and it's it's it's, it's built itself quite a niche. Um, I think that's place as a place where contemporary performers come. I think really they, yeah, I think that's where the Guild Hall could be really, really looked at as a as a space because I know there's rumours all oh, you know let's knock it down and build something else. But I actually quite like the fact it you know what it was built for in the seventy two Guild because I was in that as a little soldier boy. So, <laughs> but I think that um, it would I, I, you know we've a few people have talked in the city about that being a really great place for art performance and more of an arts based 
you know, the, the, the gig world is sort of moved on now. They want bigger venues for, for revenues, but I think it would be great for a different spin. It could be dance before, you know, different things going on, which is an interesting topic. I mean, I think that's, it's interesting though. I think that, like I said, I don't want to dwell on Preston too much. It's a bigger conversation now, but I think that we do need more of that rich culture in Preston. And I think, like I say, it's just wiring it up because without that, and it needs supporting because without that, it's the, it's the bedrock. Arts are the bedrock of society, aren't they? It's what we, you know, without creativity and without art, it's, it's going to be a, things that could be pretty dire, you know, and I think people need to just wake up on that a little bit and just put a bit more behind it, in my opinion, but hey. You know. uh, yeah, I mean, I think the arts it leads um, cultural, cultural regen regeneration, leads economic oh. generation. Yeah. And, and they know that, you know, the, the, the people who run the city know that, mm. but when it, sometimes I think when it comes to actually putting on these events, um, they don't back it up. Um, you know, they read the reports and write the reports that says arts do this, but then don't invest in it um, when it comes to money on the line as much as what, the, what possibly they should. Um, yeah, it feels a bit of a, a box ticking exercise rather than the real support behind it, I agree. I think that, I mean, obviously COVID has made it twice as bad now uh, because we can't do events. We can't, I mean, this is the thing that a lot of people I don't think are realizing. I think that there's so many, there's so many concerns out there for, I mean, I've got a son who's a musician, you know, and he's, he's desperate to get out and gig again. And now people say, well, it's just a hobby, it's a fun. It's not, it's what he wants to do. It's what he wants to make his living out of. And, there's nothing wrong with that. I support it wholeheartedly. It's like you with your events. How, how's COVID? <laughs> well, I know, I know, I know what you're gonna say, but where's your head at at the minute? What's your what's your thoughts on because I've asked I've asked I've talked to a lot of artists through this period, and a lot of them have gone, and, and there again, they're fortunate they can do this, but they've all gone, well, great, you know, COVID's not nice, obviously, but it's been a time for me to reflect and work on my techniques or this, that, and the other. And I'm, and nobody's really given me an angry response as yet. So um, I'm not saying I want an angry response, but what's, I think it's probably affecting you probably more than other folk I've spoke to maybe, apart from uh, one artist, Ian, who works in the events industry, but go on, what's your, what's your, where are you at with it? Uh, I mean, it, obviously it's been a disaster, you know, show after show, all got canceled right at the beginning, um, almost 12 months ago. Um, and none of them have come back and can't really see um, at the moment when they are going to come back. I mean, there are shows planned for the summer in September, but it, there's even doubts surrounding them. Um, if it's done socially distance on reduced capacities, most of the work I do, in fact, all the work I do with shows is um, totally independent, so it's not funded. So money comes from ticket sales and it's not enough. Um, to you know, make make any kind of profit. Um, I would still do do them and put them on because I think there'll be app there's an appetite for people to see live shows after missing out for so long. Yeah. Um, but financially for me, it, it's been a disaster. I've I've, I've not got any um, money from the government um, for the for the strange quirk that over fifty percent of my pay was through PAYE in two thousand and eighteen. Mm. And that makes me in, in, in eligible for... Um, hey, you've fallen through the gap, haven't you, really? Yeah, I have, and I'm one of the three or four million, um, and that's not going to change. So, you know, fortunately, I've been able to earn a little bit of money through other places, and I've, I've had, you know, money that um, I've saved up over the years. Mm. Um, so I'm not pleading poverty, but it has been a disaster, and I can't really see um, at the moment when it's going to change. Mm. No, well... It's a difficult one because neither I'm, I'm with you. I can't see at the minute. I'm not. I'm not overly optimistic. I'm sort of. I mean, obviously the the vaccine's moving, which is great news. But it seems to be. Um, it just seems to be a while down the line. I think. Does it? So, it, are you having to re? Are you having to rethink your practice then? I mean, what you? So you want to put these events on, and obviously you're doing them out of the passion for the arts, not necessarily from a. A monetary point of view which i'm imagining you've been doing anyway to be fair i'm sure you know you do it out of the love of it and of course you've got to make a profit you're a you're a you know you've got to make money you're not but 
I've, has this driven you to do anything in particular then? And because I know you've done sort of, you've been doing a few projects through COVID, you've been documenting it. Um, you know, what, what, where, is there anything sort of strong coming out of it that you want to really make a point out of it? Or a statement? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the show, some of them um, I make money from, some of them you don't, and that's how it is in normal times, um, you know, but you do do it for the, for the passion. Um, as someone who's freelance, self-employed, I've always had lots of different income streams. So as well as the photography, there's the writing, which I don't do too much of um, these days. But I also do a bit of lecturing, which this year was, has all been online um, for Salford University. Um, it's just all those different different income streams. But you know, photography jobs, which again, most of the photography is within the arts and it's, it's, it's festivals and events. Um, they've not happened, so I've not had those jobs. Um, mm. So, yes, you try and diversify, but it's, it's my income has just gone down, and it's just about riding it out for them at the moment. Um, the outdoor photography festival that I'm planning, that I've wanted to do for years, I am doing specifically um, so that people can see it when all the museums are closed because of COVID. So when that's set up in a couple of months' time on the streets of Preston, there can be some sort of arts engagement, which I think is really important for people to enjoy. So I, I think that's a great idea. Um, and I hope to do more of that sort of thing. Um, but it, it, it is, there's no sugar code in it. It's hard. Um, and it needs to, you know, I'm desperate for lockdown to be lifted so I can get back to work and, and back um, doing, you know, the, the jobs that I used to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is it, is obviously, so from a, a creative point of view, is there any sort of, um, is there anything you're working, has, has it done, has, have you been able to put that sort of frustration and despair and anger and all the other emotions that you're probably going through, have you managed to put that into any writing or any work at all, or are you just sort of like riding it out, or are you thinking, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and, you know, make a statement, make a point, I mean, I have been taking photographs, um, maybe not prolific, prolifically, but taking photographs of, um, you know, people certainly over, over this last summer um, in lockdown, people in the rural areas, the Lake District and Yorkshire Dales on walks, mm -hmm. um, enjoying the outdoors, but also in the cities. Um, and I do quite like um, taking photographs of people wearing masks or if I can in shops, you know, with all the, the screens put up um because i think as a documentary photographer these are really unusual times and, and eventually these screens will be taken away um and it's a really unique um thing to photograph how shops uh, look and people wearing masks mm. um so i think it's worth doing but obviously i'm not getting money for, for doing that it's um yeah. simple you know the pleasure of taking photography yeah I think, um, it's interesting actually documenting things you go around about the outdoors i think that's i mean i've always been an outdoor person and you know i'm always on a feller on my bike at the weekend and i'm out there and but it's quite interesting not so much now but obviously in summer through lockdown there's sort of the amount of um places places were sort of mobbed that were normally relatively quiet or you know just the odd walkers and now suddenly mobbed and mobbed with people that didn't seem to respect or actually, yeah, well, respect the, the area that they were in, the litter and the shit and trash that was left behind. I just thought that was, that was potentially worth documenting. I mean, it seems to have changed now through, obviously, you know, people like that don't what, like to, you know, battle with the weather like the likes of we do, but... You know, I, I've had any thought on that. Did he document any of that at all? Or yeah, no, I mean, I, I did loads right across the north from um, from Filey on the east coast to, to Blackpool, the Yorkshire Dales, um, in the Lake District. And it, it, it was really interesting because right from that first lockdown weekend when they closed the pubs, mm. those tourist destinations, the seaside resort, were absolutely rammed yeah. of people who would normally be in the pub on a Saturday. Um, so they were just much busier. But then the rural destinations, it's really interesting actually what's happened um, in the national parks, where when the lockdown was lifted, there was a massive um, increase, particularly in the Lake District and the Yorkshire Dales, of people going there who had never been to the, to the national park before. Mm. Um, 
in the Yorkshire Dales, particularly from the Asian communities, from Leeds and Bradford. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really encouraging um, and quite nice to, to see the, these different communities who had never been to a national park go there for the first time. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was a lot of um, private estates and private management who managed the situation into a bigger problem than it was by closing their own car parks or having reduced car parks. So I was at Bolton Abbey for a few days, um, which is essentially run by a private estate. And they, they, they changed their system. So it was pre book only for the car park, but they closed two thirds, three quarters of the car parks. But people were still going, but there was less parking space. So the roads were, were rammed, you know, the country roads and the police had to come in and, and, and the road was actually um, cordoned off because you, you, it was impassable. Right. Um, and there was lots of arguments with people, but it, it, that, that problem had been managed. Further up the roads, um, a farmer had decided to open his field and let people park in, and, the, and he saved his village, um, Buckton, from any any kind of trouble. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's I, I saw that a lot. You know, so there you again, that's a, yeah, that's a different perspective on it that we've not that we've not seen and what we've been fed by the media. And I think it's an interesting point because we are. You know, we want to encourage people to get out and enjoy the countryside, you know, and respect it. And I think we've been, uh, it's interesting that you were out there in it. Because that's why I thought I'd ask you because there again, we're fed by the news. I mean, I've, I've seen it firsthand, to be fair. I've seen people leave the litter and the barbecues and the mess and the, you know, and I don't quite understand that. But also, it's, there is a positive side to the fact that there's people who haven't appreciated it, maybe appreciating it a bit more, which is what it's there for in the first place. It's not an elite bubble. We don't want to put a, you know, a, a, a yeah. book over it, so you can't go in. I, I had, a, I had, a, um, I, I posted in. I think it was in November um, when we were on a general lockdown. I posted some pictures I took up um, near Grasmere on a walk in the in the Lake District, and then a guy um, messaged me privately on Instagram and said, "I love your photographs, but do you think you should be travelling um, from Preston to the Lakes? Is it safe?" And I, and I said to him, "Well." We're on, a general, we're on a general lockdown. It wasn't regionalised at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think me travelling to Preston to the Lake District without stopping and going on an outdoors walk and not coming into contact with any other local person or stopping up in the village, mm. whether I've got COVID or not, I'm not affecting anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then about a month later, at the end of December, he, he did a post on Instagram um, and he's a delivery driver who drives around Yorkshire and Lancashire. Mm. Um, delivering food to supermarkets, um, celebrating the fact that he'd travelled 26,000 miles last year. Um, <laughs> yeah. And every day stopped and offered about eight stops. Coughing and spluttering, and, everybody does. You know, and it was interesting to me where he, he couldn't see um, the, diff yeah. the, the hypocrisy of someone <laughs> planning a journey and not coming into contact with anyone and him coming into contact with dozens of people every day for a year yeah. Um, but he was accepting what he'd done has not been a problem because it's a job. And because what I was doing was, I mean, it's kind of a job for me, but you yeah. could class it as, as leisure time. He's thinking that's wrong, but what he's done right, if you're that worried about, about the lockdown, about the COVID, don't you have to give up your job? You know what I mean? And there's a lot yeah. of hypocrisy about it. The common sense, I think, is really important, no matter what the rules are. Common sense, if you're not going into contact with anyone, Exactly. On a, on a bike ride or a rural it's, walk. It's a people problem, thing. I think. Yeah, it's a people thing, isn't it? So I, I agree. If you're if you're not in contact, then you're not in contact. Simple as. I mean, just let's. Okay, so that's COVID covered. I mean, it's a tricky one. We can talk all day about it, but I think it's it's interesting because I just wondered you put in a point here about and I, there again, it's probably related because I think at the minute you've been you've had to stop and um, give up things that you've been doing and your, your momentum which you mentioned here about creative blocks and, and alcohol, which is uh, just, you know, it's an interesting thing because I, I can relate to that. I've used alcohol for creative blocks many a time. And <clears throat> in my game, it's sort of, there's a, there's a pressure of it being a commercial artist and cons, constant cover concepts and, you know, trying to come up with an idea for something. You get blocked and I've many, you know, you come, oh, I'll just have a, few glasses of wine tonight, see if that lubricates the old brain cells. It, it used to do, as I get older, it doesn't as much. So let's just 
can we tell me, can we pick on that a little bit? Because I think I do think it's relevant to now. You must be in some sort of frustrated creative mind block. Are you reaching for the bottle, or is it is that a thing of the past? No, I mean I just I just don't drink anymore. You know, once every six months I might have a shandy, um, but I don't drink. And yeah, like like I said to you. Uh, as a writer, and there's a big history of writers drinking, you know, to the point of alcoholism, really, um, which I don't necessarily agree with. But when I was solely a writer, I would carry on, you know, go out on a night and have a drink, and I just used to love drinking. Mm -hmm. um, when I started taking photographs, and I was th there was a period where I had to take photographs on Saturday nights um, of drinkers, as it happens, so I wasn't drinking. I found it really hard not to go out and drink. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I was producing what I thought were these amazing um, And I realized quite quickly that if I wasn't drinking, uh, my creative output was um, much higher. Um, and so when I stopped drinking, I had, I had this massive period of creativity, whereas before when I was drinking, apart from writing you know, newspaper stuff, uh, artistically, um, my creativity was, was very to zero. And when, when I realized that, stopping drinking was a no brainer. And, um, you know, my output as a, you know, as an artist since then has, has been you know, quite high and I've been really pleased and I never look back, basically. You, do you think, it, it be, for me, I just, I, I know I'm older now, I don't want to preach, but be, it, to me it's like a cliche now, isn't it? It's sort of, um, it feels like a cliche to get off your head to be an artist. It doesn't seem to be, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying really, but, each to their own, I suppose, and everyone's got their own reason for doing things. But, you know, like, in, I mean, we grew up in a generation where great musicians and great rock stars all seemed to self-destruct at 27. It became sort of <laughs> this uh, cliche. Um, is that something you think, do you feel, is it just a personal thing or do you feel, have you got a perspective on it or not? Um, I mean, it is, I don't know, it's personal to me. I mean, I, I absolutely I absolutely love drinking and I, I used to have the best nights out ever. Um, and it was only just drinking booze, you know, I wasn't really doing spirits, it was just lager. Um, and I absolutely loved it and I just felt like it was a party every night. Um, but I wasn't doing this creative, I wasn't, I wasn't taking these photographs or doing the more long form writing or any kind of art um, and not drinking, I just, felt that just freed me up to think about things more and have more time to do things. Um, you know, whether that's because I've got more energy because I'm not mm. lethargic and hungover, I don't know, but it, it just worked. And, and that's that's a direct relationship I had um, with alcohol and that's why I don't drink. Um, it mm. may work for other people, it may not, um, but you know, you'll never know to try it. I don't okay. know, I, I, I feel I was quite lucky that it happened like that. and. And I did it, you know, I might not have discovered that and realised that and I'd carry on drinking and not produce all this work since then. So what, um, what's your sort of, just putting the Palestine thing to one side then, what's sort of been, uh, um, what, would, what would you say would you, your highlight would have been then so far as far as your work and how your work's progressed? Where do you feel that you've really, do you feel like you've, Found a really nice niche. Is there any ways that you think, yeah, this is this is my best work? You know where? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, I've not um, done any major photography project for a few years since since my daughter was born eight, eight years ago. I I was looking after her a lot, and when I'm taking doing a photography project, and often that is essentially going out and taking photographs of people unannounced, whether that's on the street or in nightclubs or wherever. I find it really physically hard to do, mentally and physically. Um, so I, I have to get myself in, a, in the right state of mind before I go out and really push myself um, when I'm out there to take the right sort of photographs. And, and it, it's, a, it's just a constant push, push, push. So it's quite exhausting. And when my daughter was born, I didn't really take any do any documentary photographs for about four or five years um, because I found it too hard. I was able to write, um, but not photograph. Um, so the big, I don't, I've not done any big photography for projects since then. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's just, 
it was that, that sort of block again. It was, it was a bit of a block um, until, you know, she went to school, basically. And I, was, I had, had that sort of, um, that free time to concentrate on it. So, so the, the, the best sort of stuff um, after that was actually when I had this idea of showing photography as live performance. And I've developed this whole um, this set of shows where I show photography projects, exhibitions, in front of audiences in different ways, using sound and video and, and you know, big printed sheets and music. Um, and as well as being pretty much unique in performance, it, it's, um, you know, I'm almost the only photographer doing it. Um, some of it's actually quite good and it's really interesting. So I've, I've had a lot of um, enjoyment being creative and, and doing these projects and they've started from little five minute pieces well, I don't speak at all to more longer 45 minute lecture performances on, on different again, issues, but present it in this really unique way, which, which is, which is theatre, but it's also engaging, but it's all grounded on photography. Well, give me a quick example. I want to see if people need to go and have a look at this, but just give us a quick example. So it's not, it's not a lecture on technique. It's more of a, about the subject matter, is it? Yeah, yes. So the, the, the biggest one, which I, I did perform to a shocked audience in Preston, well, a few times in Preston, um, is a, a, a thing, I, it's called Warn, and it's basically a lecture performance about people who buy and sell used underwear on eBay. Okay. So, and <laughs> my interest in that is a few years ago, when I was doing um, documenting photography stuff, I was really interested in the people who sell used tights and underwear on eBay because of the photographs that they post on eBay. So I collected um, these photographs from eBay uh, yeah. of all these different sellers. And I, I was just doing little slideshows about them and stuff like that. And then I had the idea, when I was starting doing the performance stuff, I thought I can make a bigger performance um, using these photographs as a basis. Right. I then done some more research and I got in touch with some of the sellers and they, I interviewed them and they sent me some um, email conversations they've had between themselves and buyers. Um, and it's obviously, it's a fetish and there's a I'm lot gonna of... Say, I'm going to say, sure, this is a fetish market. It can't be <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fetish market. And, and, okay. and so the performance piece, it's about um, sexual fetishism and based around the buying selling of of the underwear, tights, socks. Um, it's quite explicit in some of the conversations that, that they have, that the buyers and sellers have, are um, quite what you term perverted. Um, but the, the wider piece as a whole, it discusses, you know, sex and advertising, this issue, and then it, it always shown photography and, and photographs of these people. And then it kind of discusses, um, why it happens and is there anything wrong about it and you know why in britain um there's a feeling of shame of having the fetish or in the media people are shamed for having the sort of fetish and is that right when essentially they're not doing anything illegal um and so it discusses it discusses these wider issues and presents them and makes you think um and but again it's all based on entertainment and i'm, I'm there on the stage with a clothes horse full of tights used Types that I've um, I've bought from these sellers myself, right. and certainly when I first did the show, um, they were very sweaty. And you could smell them on stage. I mean, the tights are stored in a bag, and, and the smell has long since gone. Um, but it, it, it's it's just an open discussion and trying to just discuss whether it's right and wrong that you should feel shame or people should be shamed for engaging in something that is essentially not illegal. How interesting. I mean, we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a shame culture anyway, aren't we, at the minute? I think anything on that, anything on a sexual subject seems to be a... Well, I suppose the press have always done that with celebs, haven't they, in the shame game, I suppose. Uh, but I've never heard... I've never I've never come across that one. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> so where are you going to take that? Where's, where's that? Is that, is that a, another route of... Yeah, well, I mean, I have done that. The last time I done that was was about a year ago. Just it was last January. I done it at Huddersfield at, at a festival. Um, so I have done it quite a bit. Um, I did do it a couple of years ago in Preston, upstairs at the Stanley Arms. After I I done a whole series of shows where I'd, I'd brought in some poets to do performances and different theatre stuff. 
Yeah. And I thought I'd do my own. And I was overjoyed that people bought a ticket and there's a full room um, of people to watch me perform. Because I'm, I'm not a performer um, and it's not my strength. And I'm quite awkward um, on stage, but I'm, I'm really driven by the idea um, that I can show photography to a live audience. Um, so I, I also, for instance, do do a show which is karaoke photography, where I sing two karaoke songs while holding up these big printed images um, of two photography projects. One's about breastfeeding uh, and one's about um, unhealthy living, drinking and smoking and um, eating bad food um, while singing two karaoke songs, which I've changed the lyrics to. Um, and it's I mean, it's right in your face and I sing really badly and I absolutely hate karaoke. <laughs> but I do it because it's photography. And, and so I push away all, all my all my uh, inhibitions and, and fear and, and sing these songs and talk a bit in the middle. And it's, it's... What made you progress then into this sort of um, performance? aspect then? Well, I, I just, I just had, had an idea. I saw some performance poetry, um, a performance poetry from Wigan called Louise Fasakali, and she's amazing. Um, and it's really engaging and it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant experience to hear someone uh, perform poetry. Um, you know, it's, 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 it, it makes you feel it's like seeing your favourite live band. So, you know, it's, it's that sort of feeling. Um, although poetry at school you think it's, it's not for me and it's dead boring. The performance poetry is amazing. And I just find it really engaging. And I, and I just had this idea, could I perform with photography? And I just started thinking of different ways I could do it. And the first the first little thing I did was, was I made a video or a friend of mine made a video of me showing um, a set of images um, printed quite big. And then I stand in front of the, the projector in front of the screen um, Whole, with all these cards showing these words, what the people in the in the photographs have said, mm. and so I'm showing the, the, these words as, as these images are getting shown on, on the projection screen, and so it's um, it's quite an, immer an immersive experience. But it it has people enjoy it. You know, it's got quite good, and it's just it is basically just me showing photography in an entertaining way, mm. and it's just built up from that, and it's just developing ideas with photography, um, and yeah, it's just it's just been an amazing experience, and uh, I try and come up with new ways of of showing photography. To, you know, because people go to exhibit, people don't go to exhibitions, or if they see photography in a gallery, they'll look at an image for on average a second and a half. Yeah. And I'm, I'm stood there showing them for five seconds, and I'm I'm changing the way people look at photography. Um, I love it. I think uh, we'll have to do a uh, when the when this COVID nonsense is gone because we started doing these talks at the artistry house where my studio is called. We've got a little fireplace in there, so we call them fireside talks. And we could be anything; it doesn't matter what the subject is. I'd love you to do one there. Oh, let's and, do it. Let's do it because I think it'd be great. Um, and I think uh, it'll be fun as well. I, I just love like the idea of it. It's that sort of thing that we need more of, you know, so I'm, I'm definitely going to take you up on that. We're going to do an evening of, uh, whether we do the fetish one, I don't know, that could be quite interesting. <laughs> oh, don't, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Great, well, that's, that's been amazing. God, look at the time, I can't believe it. I could talk to you all day, it's really good. It goes so quick. Um, it's been a pleasure doing this. I'm really glad you did it, because uh, like I said, our paths have crossed and we've never really, um, got engaged, you know, it's, and like I said, I'm guilty of that. It's not, so you're out doing it. I'm just out there, like all of us, just a bit like that sometimes. And well, we're, all, we're all like that, aren't we? Things pass us by. And, yeah, yeah. We need to uh, try and hook it all up a, a bit more, but no, but thanks for, thanks for doing this. It's been great and eye opening and let's, uh, let's get, let's get some shows on the road. <laughs> Yeah, when we when we when we come out the other end, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, all right, mate. Brilliant. Well, great to talk to you, and uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll catch you soon. Thank you. Good. Really? Well, yeah, enjoy, really enjoyed it. Thanks for doing it, and keep doing them because they're, they're really good. Yeah, I'm gonna try. Yeah, if you know anybody who's up for it, get over the nod and. Uh... Oh, I, I I know some uh, really, people who love self publicity. Yeah, <laughs> really uh, brilliant. Right. Okay. Great. Nice to talk to you, Gary. And I'll. Thank you, Andy. Soon. Take care. Cheers now. Bye-bye.